odds. Have you ever wondered about the pagan gods that are found in the Bible and do their remnants exist today? And that's what we're going to talk about. When anything in life is an absolute requirement for your happiness and self-worth, it is essentially an idol, something you're actually worshiping. When such a thing is threatened, your anger is absolute. Your anger is actually the way the idol keeps you in its service, in its chains. Therefore, if you find that, despite all your efforts to forgive, your anger and bitterness cannot subside, you may need to look deeper. What am I defending? What is so important, I can't live without it. It may be, until some inordinate desire is identified and confronted, you may not be able to master your anger. Tim Keller I think Tim Keller has a quote for everything. But think about what it is that makes you angry anytime it's challenged, beyond what God wants in our lives. Today we're going to talk about paganism in the Bible. I know that's not a really popular word, particularly in this world where we're trying to be pluralistic. And just for the record, when I say gods, there are no other gods. There's only one God. But people will treat other things other concepts, as gods. And so when I say gods, I'm meaning it from the sense of what people worship. But the Bible talks a lot about other gods that people worship and how he treated worshipers, what was done in the name to get people away from the other gods. In fact, there's a whole Ten Commandment about it. Thou shalt not worship other gods. The idea is that in the Bible, these other gods existed at the time. And we talked in the episodes about history, about all the different people types. We had the Persians, we had the Arameans, we had the Greeks, the Romans, Baal worshipers. We know a lot about the practices of religion at the time of the Bible. A couple of questions exist is why was it so important that these gods were mentioned or the worship of these gods, they did not exist, were mentioned? And do they still exist today? Is there still a worship of these types of things? I was a bit surprised there had been a number of crimes committed by people, really horrible crimes, and I don't want to go into all of them, but everything from the shooting of Gabby Gifford said something like he was a Viking worshiper. Then there was another shooting where the person said that they too were worshipers of Viking gods. And I thought, how did this happen? Then I did the podcast where I talked about the Nazis and that Hitler was an atheist. He didn't believe in any gods. He thought we should be done with all of this. But his people, there was a group of Nazis that existed that were trying to bring back the Norse religion. I think because it was considered to be a very Aryan religion. What is with Vikings? How are people becoming Vikings? So then it led me to the question, are any of these religions and faiths that are existing today similar in any way to what people also worshipped in the Bible? I mentioned the last podcast that idolatry in general is considered to be almost like a person cheating on their merit. Many times when the Bible talks about our relationship to God, it talks about it as a marriage. The church is the bridegroom. Christ is the groom. When Hosea was forced to marry a prostitute so he would understand idolatry because that is what the people were doing to God, there's all sorts of relationships in there about cheating on a marriage and how the worship of other gods is like that. It's the ultimate destruction of a relationship in a marriage and our relationship with God. And then I came across an article, which I'll put in the show notes, but it was talking about modern day paganism and how it's coming back, that there are more people who say they worship Wicca, Viking lore, than have existed in a long time. I mean, this used to be just a scattering of people. Heck, I was even seeing about how the Jedi religion has a number of people who say they worship that. I think it's more of a joke to most people 
They just don't identify as anything, and they think it's funny that they're a Jedi. But in reality, there are people who are beginning to say they believe in some of these older ancient religions. And some of it has to do with the fact that they don't want to be in the Christian faith. And so there are people who say, well, I'm a Satan worshiper because it's the opposite of being a Christian. I just want to be contrary. I want to be countercultural to the Christian culture. And I, like I said, I met someone, I used to work with someone who said he was a Satanist. And when I asked him to explain, you know, what it is he believed, he just basically said that he was an atheist. He just wants to be against anything Christian. And even when we talk about believe science, it's not something to believe. Science is a series of evidence that points to a theory. And a theory tries to explain the best way we can a hypothesis, a statement. Gravity brings things towards the center of a heavy weight. So that's why we stay attached to the earth, the theory of gravity. Everything's a theory. We don't believe science. We challenge science. We look at evidence of science. It's like saying we have to believe art or we have to believe this or believe that. We have different ways of describing the world. Art describes what we see and music describes what we hear. And science describes, I think, investigating the rules that exist in the planet's in the way God created the universe. But all these things are taking us towards or trying to take us towards a paganism of a kind. So we have some different gods that are in the Bible. We'll talk about a few of them. The first one is Baal. That was the one that was mentioned quite frequently. A lot of people were Baal worshipers. There's Moloch. There's the Greek gods, the Roman gods, some of which Paul addressed um, and Ephesus, because Ephesus was a place of worshiping Athena and fertility gods. So some of them we know more about too. Baal used to be a common word for God, but it also means that if someone else calls a different God, God, then it becomes a pagan word for God. And that's where most people, like Jezebel, she was a Baal worshiper. She wasn't worshiping God at all. In general, many of these other faiths were polytheisms. They believed in many gods, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arameans, the Persians, uh, the Zoasters also believed in many gods. And a lot of times these polytheisms were more about trying to accommodate other people in the world. So you're in Babylon and you just sacked a group of people. You would add their collection of gods to your collections of gods. So it was almost like they captured gods like we would capture communities or towns or nations or languages. And there were even other gods that aren't mentioned in the Bible, too. When we think about like German religions, certainly the Celtic, there are other religions that were out there. Some of them were related to each other even, and some of them were taking gods from other places and then sort of adapting them to making them a little bit more like what they were expected. The Roman religion is made up of a lot of different societies, gods, so that they can make a community with many different people. The Sanskrit, we talk about the Akkadians, and then we even go over towards China and Japan and the gods that were in the religions that were there. So not only the Bible have a series of gods that people worshipped throughout the world, people believed in a multitude of gods. And then we get even into the more modern times. A lot of these gods were worship of nature, right? We had Zeus, who was the thunder and lightning god. You know, we had some of the older gods when it comes to the Greek religion had to do with nature, thunder and lightning and rain and fertility. And then as people got more sophisticated, their gods became war, love, you know, relationships. And so then their gods got to be a level down from just nature gods. But even so, we still see people today that worship Gaia, that do worship the God of the earth and the land. And even if they're not doing so in the name of God, they do worship the earth as an environment, as a planet. And so some of the people in the environmental movement actually have ecology built into a kind of religion too. Things can go to the point where something that is beneficial or just a thing of humanity, let's take care of the planet, suddenly becomes as big as a religion. 
And so that leads to the question, what exactly is a religion? When I was in college, I took a class on something called the hermeneutics of religion. It was a graduate level class, and it said that religions have a creation, they have an end, they have a philosophy of how people should live their lives, and they have an item of worship, a god, a nature, a something, and then that item has certain characteristics. And so when we talk about how the earth was created, how the earth is going to end, who created it, and what is the nature of what was creating the earth, and what it is we should be doing, there's a lot of things that don't seem like religion, but certainly are religions. Heck, I even have seen where I think the lack of religion is a religion. Someone said, it's fine to be in America with religious views, as long as your religious view means that you don't worship anything. And I thought, well, that's not religion. But in a sense, that person's religion was the lack of religion. They believed to the point of worship, there is no God. And so then when you say something can't be religious, and we go to the point of saying there is no God, also is a religion. It has a creation, it has an end, it has what created the world, and a rule of ethics or beliefs of how a person should act because of this. So we can go down this rabbit hole a long time. We can talk about Nietzsche and all the different parts of it. But essentially, in the postmodern world, we make gods all the time. I talked about the book, The American Gods, where the gods of that book were money, power, entertainment, and then the one god of the world who could not survive, who would not allow any other gods to survive at all. Now, that's a fiction book, but in a sense, I think he has the right idea about what the postmodern world god looks like and the other gods around him. So just in some general ideas, there's natural religions, you know, where, like I said at the beginning, where we're talking about believing in a world of nature. There's a lot of that in the very ancient religions, the creation stories of other religions, that how the world came, and it's all natural events, the oceans, the storm, the weather. Those are some of the oldest other religions out there. And some of those don't even have names or have many names for the same part of it, but it's considered to be a naturalistic pantheism. We have Baal. Baal, again, like I said, was a title meaning owner, lord. But, but what people meant when they were Baal worshippers, it had a lot to do with the sun and other type of uh, deities that were out there. And Baal also was related to storms, fertility god, Hadad, and other types of local manifestations. Not everyone believed in the same pieces of it. Baal was used for Marduk, which was the god of the Babylonians, and was considered to be a Canaanite god. Now, if you think about Canaanites as being related to Cain, as in Cain and Abel, the children of Adam, again, as they parted areas, they started to develop into their own religion. They left the faith of the Bible and of Genesis and of the believers. There were worshipers of Hadad by the Arameans, Baal by the Phoenicians. There was Baal Zebub, which we tend to think of as the devil, but that had to do with the Lord of the Flies, meaning that these were worship of other people. It was the God that Elijah primarily went up against, trying to show everyone, my God is real. What you are worshiping was the Lord of the Flies, meaning a pile of poop. That's what where flies come from. So in a sense, even as far back as Elijah, he was fighting Baal. Ashtaroth was the god of the Phoenicians, probably related to Astarte, Ishtar, which was the Babylon version of it. Sumerians had Inanna, but they were all mentioned together, and they had a lot to do with the fertility rites. Sexuality was a part of it. And so 
a lot of the religion and faith had to do with um, prostitute cults and also had to do with the sacrifice of babies when it came to it. Moloch was a god that was mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, primarily in Leviticus, also related to child sacrifice. It was a Canaanite god. Again, as Canaanite people got farther and farther away from the god of Adam and Eve and grew in popularity as the Phoenicians brought that religion to other places. That's where they think it had a lot to do with the Carthaginians' child sacrifice and even possibly Minotaur, right? In the Minotaur, people were supposed to be thrown into the maze of the Minotaur to be eaten and destroyed. It was part of a sacrifice, but all coming from that basic idea of child sacrifice. And so when Moloch was worshipped in that way, it was why the Bible speaks so harshly of it. We're not supposed to sacrifice children. We're not, we're supposed to care for children. That was one of the surprising things about the Hebrew religion, about God, and about Jesus. Children matter. In almost every other religion out there, Greek, Roman, Moloch, Baal, children didn't matter. I won't get too deeply into it, but when we talk about the Gnostics, the Gnostics became kind of a big deal. They've been a big deal through the whole time. But the idea with the Gnostics is the body doesn't matter. The body is evil. Food pleasure, sexuality, everything physical is bad, and everything spiritual is good because the body doesn't matter. It's the spirit that's good. And that's why the Gnostics, which was considered to be a heresy, even mentioned in the Bible, but got stronger as it went on, didn't think that Jesus came back in the body, in the flesh. That's why it was so important when Jesus said, touch the nail hole in my hand. He was physically there. He ate dinner with his apostles. The Gnostics said, no, he didn't. He couldn't have. Because when Jesus was released from his physical being, he was released from all the evil, which goes all the way back to the sacrifices that were made at the time. For Baal, for Moloch, all the different religions that were existing in the Bible. People would dance around the Ashtaroth pole and that had to do with sexuality. Again, it was like someone said, a gentleman's club. It was considered to be a dance to lure men to doing acts that the Bible didn't want them to participate in. But this is mentioned in Isaiah. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy. But that particular cult of Ashtoreth was part of the sexuality cult and trying to entice other people through sex to walking away from God, look at what you can have over here. Makes me wonder if Dionysus was an extension, a later extension of that that the Greeks had and the Romans had. They had these giant parties that were filled with everything that we won't talk about, but drinking a lot of wine, going into a frenzy, sacred prostitutes, you know, in the religions, all started back in Baal, and I don't know, ending up in Dionysus. And we see today, as people have these gigantic parties, these giant events, these concerts where everyone goes and does everything that we're not going to talk about in this podcast, but it makes you wonder if the fruits of these giant music festivals, these big events, these sites out there that are telling us to give up anything that we're supposed to be doing in the name of this type of a frenzied cult kind of feels a little bit familiar. And this was interesting to me when it came to these religions, too, is that Moses, when he was bringing the 10 plagues to the Egyptians, was fighting each of the gods the Egyptians had. Turning the water to blood was going towards happy. Frogs coming from the Nile, the Nile god was hectic. Lice coming from the earth was Geb. Swarms of fly was Kepri. The death of the cattle was Hathor. She was the cow goddess. Ashes turning to boils and sores, Isis, hail from the form of fire, Newt, locusts sent from the sky, Set, days of darkness, Ra, who was the sun god, and then the death of the firstborn was going directly from Pharaoh, who considered himself a god and his first heir to be a god with him. So you might not know that, but to us, the plagues seemed a little bit random, 
But to someone at that time, it was a hit list for all the Egyptian gods. Nowadays, we have a lot of what used to be called a little bit more new age. And it made me think that when everyone talks about atheism and how atheism is taking over everything, I don't think that's really true. I see crystals, astrology. I see people trying to, again, read nature and new ageism. We talk about people being interested in the Celtic religion, people being interested in the Druids. We had Zen. We have all sorts of practices from other religion. It seems to me that instead of religion being turned away, it's more popular than ever. The difference is, is they're saying, oh, it's not a religion, but yet they're going through the motions of being in a religion. All of the different practices. When we have Marie Kondo saying thank you to objects that you, you know, served us well, but now we're getting rid of you, that's part of um, Shintoism. When we have Feng Shui, that's part of a religion too. Some practices in yoga, I'm not going to say yoga itself, but some practices inside of yoga and systems where you're trying to come up with a chakra, it has to do with religion. So we're taking all these bits and pieces from various religions and trying to turn them into what they call the new age religion. We're trying to create a religion almost like the Babylonians took all the gods, again, captured the gods from other religions and turned it into a more unified thing. We just won't call it religion, but it's a very religious belief that's going out there. And sometimes even Jesus is in there too. Sometimes you light up a candle for Jesus, and then you light up a candle for some popular figure. We're, we're turning the worship of people into something that's acceptable because they stand for the things that we believe in. And then the last point is, is that sometimes reason becomes a god. We're going to, again, believe science. And we had people like Francis Bacon or Descartes who tried to lay the pathway that reason was something to stand with, that reason, human reason, was up there with God. Except the problem is, is that when we look at people and we see them reasoning, a lot of times they reason into bad directions. They don't come up with a good method. How can we judge human reason as being something worth worshiping or believing in when people use that same reason and come to many different conclusions. My reason says this, but your reason says that. And so in a sense, our reason is so subjective that worshiping it, much like worshiping science, doesn't even make sense. There is no such thing as the science, and there's no such thing as the reason. It's all something we have. It's a tool that we have. So in the end, this idea of this particular podcast is that when we talk about the gods of the Bible, they weren't gods, they weren't real people. A lot of times they were part of polytheisms where, again, these countries tried to collect gods and tried to make a unified nation. If we could just take in everyone's gods, then everyone can be a part of our nation. Instead of more like America, we're going to let you worship who you want to worship. We're not collecting gods, we're just leaving it up to you. In this particular case, those gods came in with faith. When we talk about the northern kingdom of Israel, the reason it was in so much trouble is because it had been sacked by the Babylonians. It had been attacked by so many nations. The people were driven out and brought to Babylon, were brought to Assyria, and then replaced by anyone else. People who wandered in, some people were forcibly moved in. And so when we talk about Jezebel, we talk about some of the people who were in the northern kingdom, they were part of other countries and part of other faiths. And they brought those faiths in contact with the believers in the land of Israel. And that's why when you hear people talk about the Northern Kingdom or Samaria, because essentially they had already been corrupted by these Northern other country religions. We are monotheism. We believe in one God. We don't collect gods. And we don't force God on other people. We tell people about God. And if, even if we feel like we moved so far away, we're so much more advanced than the time of the Bible. In essence, the evil we see around us 
is still represented, and we call it Baal, Ashtaroth, Moloch. It's the same kinds of evil we see today. In the end, people are evil in the same kind of way people have always been evil. We just put different names on it. And so it's for us to realize that we are meant to have one God. That is Jesus. That is the God, the Father, who tells us to follow him and be pure in our faith with God. We don't want to follow and worship other things. But I thought this was interesting and an interesting look at how the worship of other people in the Bible kind of affect us today and how we still essentially have the very same beliefs, even without the same names, as we do then. So my challenge to you is think about the things that matter most to you. In that quote from Timothy Keller, where he talks about anything that we love to the point where it makes us angry, Is there anything in your life that you love that much? See if that is something that has lost its rightful position in your life and has become maybe not a God, but something that is so important that you need to get away from because it matters to you so much, even to the point of anger. Start writing down some initial steps of what you can do Put a little distance between you and that thing. All right, everyone, thanks so much. This was a difficult podcast to write, and I think it was a difficult podcast to read, but I appreciate you listening to it. Please let me know if you have any comments, questions, if you think I'm wrong about something. You can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm happy to hear anything that you have to say. And remember, the path towards God and away from other things starts with small steps. Small steps.